Welcome back to Van's Reading. We're on Rule 4, Part 1. Uh, the rule is called Notice that Opportunity Lurks Where Responsibility Has Been Abdicated. So, let's begin. Make yourself invaluable. In my due role as a clinical psychologist and professor, I have coached many people in the development of their careers. Sometimes those I sometimes those I am coaching consult me uh, be, consult me because their co-workers, subordinates or bosses will not do their jobs properly. They are supervised by working alongside or managing people who are narcissistic, incompetent, male malevolent or tyrannical. tyrannical. Uh, such things happen and must be dealt with in whatever reasonable manner or bring them to a halt. I do not, I do not encourage people to martyr themselves. It is a bad idea to sacrifice yourself uncomplainingly so that someone else can take the credit. Nonetheless, under such circumstances, if you are a wise and attentive person, you might still notice that your unproductive co-workers are leaving a plethora of valuable tasks undone. You might then ask yourself, what would happen if I took responsibility for doing that? It is a daunting question. What is left undone is often risky, difficult, and necessary. That also means uh, that, oh, 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 sorry, let me go back. But that also means, does it not, that it, that it is worthwhile and significant. And you, may, and you may have the eyes to see that there is a problem despite your all too frequent blindness. How do you know that it is not therefore your problem? Why do you notice this issue and not some others? This is a question worth considering in depth. If you want to become invaluable in the workplace, in any community, just do the useful things no one else is doing. Arrive earlier and leave later than your com compatriots, but do not deny yourself your life. Organize what you can see is dangerous, dangerously disorganized. Uh, Work when you are working instead of looking like you're working. And finally, learn more about the business or your competitors than you already know. Doing so will make you invaluable, invaluable, a variable linchpin. People will notice that that and begin to appreciate your hard earned mer merits. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Sorry. <laughs> you might object. Well, I just could not manage to take on something that important. What if you began to build yourself into a person who could? You could start by trying to solve a small problem, something that is bothering you, that you think you could fix. You could start by confronting a dragon of just the size that you're likely to defeat. A tiny serpent might not have had the time to hoard a lot of gold, but there might still be some treasure to be won, along with a reasonable prob probability of succeeding in such quests and not too much chance of fury or twosome death. Under reasonable circumstances, picking up the excess responsibility is an opportunity to become truly invaluable. And then if you want to negotiate for a raise or more autonomy or more free time for the matter, you can go to your boss and say, here are 10 things that were crying out to be done, each of them vital. And I now... And I am now doing all of them. If you help me out a bit, I will continue. I might even improve. And everything, including your life, will improve along with, along with me. And then if your boss has any sense, and sometimes bosses do, then your negotiation will be successful. That is how such things work. And do not forget that there is no shortage of genuinely good people who are thrilled if they can give someone useful and trustworthy a hand up. It is... It is one of the truly altruistic pleasures of life and its depth is not to be underestimated or to be dis disregarded with the cheap cynicism that masks itself as a world-weary wisdom. It appears that the meaning that most effectively sustain life is to be found in the adoption of responsibility. When people look back on what they've accomplished, they think if they are fortunate. Well, I did that and it was valuable. It was not easy, but it was worth it. It is a strange and paradoxical fact that there is a reciprocal relationship between the worth of something and the difficulty of accomplishing it. Imagine the following conversation. Do you want difficulty? <laughs> no, I want ease. In your, experience, in your experience, has doing something easy been worthwhile? No. Well, no, not very often. Then perhaps you really want something difficult. I think that is the secret to the reason for being itself. Difficult is necessary. It is for this reason that we voluntarily and happily place limitations on ourselves. Every time we play a game, for example, we accept, to set, we accept a set of arbitrary restrictions. We narrow and limit ourselves and explore the possibilities thereby revealed. That is what makes the game, but it does not work without the arbitrary 
arbitrary rules, you take them on voluntarily, absurdly, as in chess. I can only move this knight in L. How ridiculous, but how fun, because it is not fun, oddly enough, if you can move any piece anyway. It is not a game anymore if you can make any old move at all. Except some limitations, however, and the game begins. Accept them, more broadly speaking, as a necessary part of being and a desirable part of life. Assume you can transcend them by accepting them, and then you can play the limited game properly. And this is not merely a psychological import, and it is by no means just a game. People need meaning, but problems also need solving. It is very salutary from the psychological perspective to find something of significance, something worth sacrificing for or to something worth confronting and taking on. But the suffering and malevolence that characterize life are real with the terrible consequences of the real. And our ability to solve problems by confronting them and taking them on is also real. By taking responsibility, we can find a meaningful path, improve our personal lot psychologically and make what is intolerably, intolerably wrong generally better. Thus, we can have our cake and eat it too. Responsibility and meaning. The idea that life is suffering is a relatively universal truism of religious thinking. This is the first of the four noble truths of Buddhism, as well as well as a key, as well as a key Hindu concept. There is a tradition that the ancient Indian word for suffering, dukkha, from the Pali language, uh, dukkha, from Sanskrit, is derived from dus and ka, particularly the whole in a horse-drawn cartwheel through which the axle passes. The proper place for such a hole is dead center right on target. The ride is likely to be very bumpy otherwise, with the bumps directly proportional in magnitude to the degree of offset. This is quite reminiscent to me of the Greek term hamartia, hamartia, hamartia? I think it's hamartia, which is frequently translated as sin in the context of Christian thought. Hamartia. What originally was hamartia was originally an archery term and it meant to miss the mark or target. There are many ways that a target can be missed frequently in my clinical practice and in my personal life i observed that people did not get what they needed or equally importantly perhaps what they wanted because they never made it clear to themselves or others what that was it is impossible to hit a target after all unless you aim at it in keeping with this people are more commonly upset by by what they did not even try to do than by the errors they they actively committed while engaging with the world at least if you misstep while doing something, you can learn from doing it wrong, but to remain passive in the face of life, even if you exercise your inaction as means of avoiding error, that is a major mistake. As a great blues musician, Tom Waits insists in his song, A Little Rain, you must risk something that matters. This is a colossal blunder made, for example, by the fictional Peter Pan. Pan, a name echoing the Greek god of the wilds, means encompassing everything. Peter Pan, the magical boy, is capable of everything. He is a potential itself, like every child, and that makes him magical in the same way that every child is magical. But, but time whittles that magic away, transform, transforming the fascinating potentially of childhood into the oft apparently more mundane but genuinely actuality of adulthood. The trick, so to speak, is to trade that early possibility for something meaningful, productive, long-term, and sustainable. Peter Pan refuses to do so. This is at least in part because his major role model is Captain Hook. Captain Hook is the archetypal, ty ty tyrannical king, the, patholo the pathology of order. A parasite and a tyrant terrified of death. He has his reasons. Death stalks Hook in the form of crocodile with a clock in his stomach. That is time, tick-tock, tick-tock. That is life vanishing as the seconds march by. The crocodile has had a taste of hook too and liked it. That is life as well. It is not only cowards who are terrified by what lurks down in the chaotic depths. It is, it is a rare person who has not suffered through disappointment, disease and the death of a loved one by the time childhood ends. Such experiences can leave those who have had them bitter, resentful, predatory and, and tyrannical uh, tyrannical, tyrannical, just like Hook. Sorry, uh, tyrannical, tyrannical. I don't know. It's up to you how to say that word. Uh, let me say that again. Such experiences can leave those who have had them bitter, resentful, predatory, and tyrannical, just like Hook. With a role model like the captain, it is no wonder Peter Pan does not want to grow up. Better to remain king of the lost boys. Better to remain lost in fantasy with Tinkerbell, who provides everything a female partner can provide, except that she does not exist. 
We indeed the great love of Pan's life chooses to grow up despite her admiration for her friend Peter. She takes her husband facing even welcoming her matura maturation and its lurking hints of mortality and, de and death. She consciously chooses to sacrifice her childhood for the realities of adulthood, but gains real life in return. Peter remains a child, magical to be sure, but still a child and life-limited, finite and unique passes him by. In the J.M. Berry play Peter Pan or the boy who would not grow up, Pan is portrayed as unafraid of death, which he faces on Maruna's rock. His attitude might be misunderstood by by inattentive viewers as courage after all pan says to die will be an awfully big adventure but the psychology the but the psychologically insightful unseen uh, narrator objects to live would be an awfully big adventure truly a statement about what might have happened at ha what might have happened had the boy king chosen wendy noting immediately afterward but he can never quite get the, the hang of it Pan's hypothetical lack of fear of death is not courage, but the manifestation of his basically suicidal nature, the sickness of life, which he constantly manifesting by his very refusal to mature. It is by no means a good thing to be the oldest person at, at the frat party. It is desperation masquerading a, as cool rebelliousness, and there is a touchy despondence and arrogance that goes along with it. It smacks, it smacks of Neverland. In the same manner, the attractive potential of a directionless but talented 25-year-old starts to look hopeless and pathetic at 30 and downright past its expiration date at 40. You must sacrifice something of your manifold potential in exchange for something real, life, real in life. Aiming at something, discipline yourself or suffer the consequence. And what is that consequence? All the suffering of life with none of the meaning. Is there a better description of hell? Life is Dukkha for the Buddhists. Equally, perhaps, although less explicitly for the Hindus, the Hebrew scriptures, for their part, chronicle the history of the suffering of the Jewish people individually and as a nation, although the triumphs are not ignored. Even those who are called on by YHWH himself to move into the adventure of life by no means escape catastrophe. Perhaps Abraham, the archetypal, archetypal patriarch, had an intuition of this. He was clearly something of a Peter Pan himself. The biblical account insists that Abraham stayed safely in, in, ensconed within his father's tent until he was very seven, he was 75 years old, a late start even by today's standards, then called by God, inspired by the voice within. Let us say to leave family and country be journeys forward into life. And what does he encounter after heeding the divine call to adventure? First, fam, first famine, or is it famine? I thought first famine, then tyranny in Egypt. The potential loss of his beautiful wife to more powerful men, exile from his adopted country, conflicts over territory with his kinsmen, war and the kidnapping of his nephew, extended childlessness, despite God's promise to make him the the progen I think I think the progenitor of a, of a great nation. So, despite God's promise to make him the progenitor of a great nation, and finally, terrible conflict between his spouses. The Abrahamic story made a great impact on me when I began to study and appreciate more deeply. It has its course. It has, it, oh gosh, I'm so tired. It has, a, it has, a, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. Uh, it has at its core a strange combination of pessimism and realistic, genuine encouragement. The pessimism, even if you are all called by God himself to venture out into the world, as Abraham was, life is going to be exceptionally difficult. Even under the best of all conceivable circumstances, almost insuperable obstacles will emerge and obstruct your path. The encouragement, you will have the opportunity to reveal yourself as much stronger and more competent than you might imagine. There is a potential within you, some of that magic so evident in childhood that will emerge when circumstances demand and transform you, God willing, into someone who can prevail. There is a very old idea which I have only recently come to comprehend, at least in part. It is something you see manifested in many literally imagist, imag oh, imagistic, imagistic and dramatic forms, ancient and modern. It has to do with responsibility and meaning, but its true significance appears hidden in precisely the same way that that the wisdom dreams can bring forth is so often hidden. It is associated with the labyrinthine myth of the hero. He who speaks magic words, see what others cannot or refuse to see, overcomes the giants, leads his people, slay the dragon, find the treasure, 
hard to attain and rescue the virgin. These are all variants of the same perceptual and behavioral pattern, which is an outline of the universally adaptive pattern of being. The hero is also he who rescues his father from the belly of the beast. What could this idea what could this idea express so commonly in narrative form possibly mean? So again, okay, I'm gonna stop it there because uh, that's part one. Um it's interesting. Uh, the very idea of recently. So what's what's I like that he's saying that that in the Peter Pan thing that that men tend to you know they want to stay young. They want to live forever. Whereas women tend to comprehend that quickly. And I think that that's what Peter Pan is about. As someone's you know some conscious who wrote it down in a more playful manner for children to read because it's a heavy dark topic. Is that the fact is that everyone wants to live forever but some people get to realize that they don't get to live forever and therefore have to move on and mature and and grow up in life and understand what responsibility has to be taken forth um i really liked what did i like about this uh, part i mean yeah he's right about you need to you know learn everything about what you do in your job or whatever you you're trying to figure out um, I agree with that entirely. I think a lot of people tend to just give up. You know, I think a lot of people tend to be like, well, that's my life now. Well, actually, it's usually not that. It's basically some people just tend to, you know, decide to live on and think that the more mature option is, is, is to, you know, raise a family and become a mother and a father as soon as possible. And then that's life. I think that's great. But it's also shit because the fact is, I think every person is capable, like he says, to slay the dragon or save the father from the belly of the beast or, you know, save the virgin, blah, blah, blah. You know, you, that, it's super interesting. Like, I think what I'm interested in is what makes a great man. You know, that's that's what's interesting to me is that, you know, people like, oh, be a, I mean, yeah, sure, be a father. Great. I mean. Is awesome and i want to be a father but not now <laughs> but what's interesting is that that a lot of people tend to give up even if it means to the death you know they want they take like look like, i think that's also the issue with like with the peter pan thing is that peter pan has it likes to live in fantasy land and the question is how you know peter peter doesn't want to take the responsibility of that of that fantasy which is interesting i mean he, he doesn't want to take the responsibility of maturing because he sees what comes next sickness illness craziness uh more confusion blah 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 he rather live in a, a more peaceful environment where it's just children you know and that's an interesting thing but i think that's where most people want to look but i think this 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 is where i think peter may confuse people with the peter pan thing because it can throw you off is that you know, I think he's trying to say, get off the fantasy, right, bro? Wake up, you know, do something meaningful with your life and realize, take the responsibility and it's going to suck because there's there's more meaning in difficulty than there is in in uh, in, ease, in ease, right? So that's, I agree with. But then also, like, the that you must aim, right? Or aim for something. And that's an interesting part. It's like, sure, where did I read this? I think I read it there. Is that he talks about aiming at a goal? Okay, so but what I also realized when you start climbing for that goal, you start to realize what's wrong with that goal, and that's an interesting thing. Is that you know these topics, need, these rules, I think need to merge together a bit because when you put them in, you know, in steps or whatever, rule one, rule two, rule three, they can kind of you know, become a little like wrong for certain times. For instance, like a, two people fighting in MMA and it's a big event, like let's say Jake Paul and Tommy Fury right now. That's a term that comes up quite often now. Um, but what's interesting is about that is, is who should have the goal? Or who, what should the person aim for? Is it unrealistic for that person to like think, oh, I can beat this guy? No, it has to depend on the situation of that. Uh, aim right so for instance if you're a poor guy and you want to be a billionaire let's say you start from zero to one right i mean like you start with nothing and then you want to go to there right 
what do you need to do? You need to start with the first step, right? So that's where you should be aiming at. I think uh, a lot of people tend to like aim high, right? No, aim for the goal and then go on the next goal and then what, you know, make it like gradual. But then it, once it goes gradual, you start to get closer to your goal. Now the question is how far do you, you need to go? That is a great question because the fact is you need to put in a lot of effort and you have to also do it correctly because you also need to realize what is wrong with certain steps at the right time. And some steps in life can be wrong. You know, it can be uh, misleading or, you know, you have certain information in your head that you already believe and it's wrong entirely, but you don't know yet. And then you discover it that what you were looking for is not what you were looking for. And therefore you need to to change course. So I think, you know, these rules are interesting in the fact like, OK, take responsibility. You don't. What I like is that he's admitting to the fact that people need to realize that not everyone you know like he's admitting the fact that people are the same and the only way to become kind of like important in this world is to actually take the responsibility or uh, the role in this in the hierarchy of life let's say that and that's super interesting right and it does you know that makes sense that that does make sense to do it that way because then once you can then you can go up in steps and i like that he's actually trying to describe this is what you need to do to go up but the problem is with the rule concept are you giving us the list of rules or are you giving us like like do we need to follow rule one rule two like like a game right he's like saying oh you need rules to make the game easier blah 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 facts but sometimes specific rules ruin the game or you know it doesn't make sense in the game so this is where it's key here is that i think the rules make sense, but in specific, so, you know, take, you need to go back and focus on what is the correct way of doing things. I don't know. I feel like he needs to revise this a bit then. Maybe not make a rule, maybe make a, I think this is for, for him to like, to spread out the information and make us help us understand uh, what, how he's thinking in terms of how we should live life. Sure. But there is also, like, it, it is, it's more organized, let's say that. But the fact is, it doesn't work with rules entirely in the world. Like, if you live, rule by, like, right now we live by rules. But then, like, there it is again, right? The fact that he also says himself, you can break, rules are meant to be broken. It means that follow the rules and then be more creative about the rules and change them yourself. So he is setting the, you know, the, the steps of how to follow these rules. So it does make sense if I think about it right now. If he admits saying, okay, the rules here you must follow, but you need to be more creative later about how to evolve as a person because these rules are a, a, a step forward, not not a really a forever guide, right? I mean, I don't know. Is it a forever guide? Or I think taking response, it's more for people, I don't know. I think it is for everybody. It's a hierarchical rule book. Let's put it that way. You follow the rules in the hierarchy, you're going to go up the rule. I think that makes more sense, right? Follow the rules and you can break the rules depending if the rules are helping you get blocked. And also many rules can be mis not misleading, it can mean anything sometimes depending on the situation, right? These rules are like great, but then some rules may not apply for certain situations. It depends. It really depends. But uh, I think the book is good. It's teaching, it's, it's giving an eye opener to people like, hey, yo, this is actually what's going on subconsciously within people's minds. And there is a kind of subconscious rule set that people are following and they need to follow. Like, I like the idea of like how people are chosen with, uh, between people when like for instance for dodgeball and they have to choose the strongest or the wisest or whatever the strategic most strategic and the, they choose the and not choose the the most the how you say it, the, the weakest of the, of the pack so that was an interesting thing and i think that's he's trying i see what he's trying to do he the book the rules are more like follow the step follow the steps follow the steps right he's trying to build information gradually up with it i like that the fact that the rules are not you know like everywhere usually this is a rule this is a rule this is a rule this. it's more like no 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 you 
you have to go read the book rule by rule. If you go back, if you like read a random rule, it doesn't make sense because you need each of these rules to kind of communicate with each other, to make a, a you know, an idea of, of what, how to live, maybe an ideal of how to live. And I think that's pretty good. Okay, that's good. Anyway, that's rule for part one. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one. Comment, like, subscribe, you know, the whole shebang.